Hello everyone. So in this free lecture tutorial, we're going to cover a little bit of information that I left out earlier when we had discussed double spacement reactions in chapter eight. If you recall, on a number of occasions in class, I would put a double displacement reaction equation up on the board, and then I would proceed to not only predict the products, but also predict the states of matter for each of the products. And at the time, uh, I had mentioned that basically this would be something that we would cover later in the year, and alas, here we are at that part of the year where that's going to be covered. And so the way that I was able to do that for you, you know, when we covered Chapter 8, was by making use of something called the solubility rule. Now, we're going to discuss in class a more convenient way to remember these rules as opposed to depending on a table like the one that I'm showing you here. But in the beginning, it's good to have something that's a little bit more visual that allows you to understand how the predictions are made. And then in class, we'll just talk about strategies for remembering the rules in a way that's a bit more concise. And so the way the table works is actually somewhat simple. Basically, the cations are listed here running down the left-hand side. The anions are listed going across from left to right. And so for any particular compound, suppose I wanted to understand uh, the solubility of something like, say, aluminum acetate. Okay, I would go and I would look up the acetate ions that happens it's right here in the first item on the left and if i were to look up aluminum aluminum is the very first cation that's listed vertically i would travel to the intersection the box that intersects both of those ions and then if you notice in this particular box we're told that the compound is soluble so that means that if i were to put this compound in water i would anticipate that it would give me an aqueous solution now, to contrast that, suppose I wanted to understand a little bit about the solubility of something like, say, barium sulfate. And again, I would look across the table to see where my sulfate compounds are listed, and they're right here, the very last column in the table. And I would look up my cations and see that barium is third from the top, listed alphabetically. Again, I would have a look at the intersection between the two ions on the table. And in this instance, you'll see that it is predicted that this compound is insoluble. And so what that means is if I were to go and actually put barium sulfate in water, it would not dissociate in the manner that we learned about in the first section of chapter 12. Instead, it would remain a solid and basically sink to the bottom of the container and it would just sit there without dissolving into the water. And so let's have a look and see how we would apply these same rules to a chemical reaction to predict the physical state of the product. Uh, in this particular example that I have to start, I have sodium chloride interacting with silver acetate, and that's going to yield sodium acetate and silver chloride based on what we've learned about double displacement reactions. I'm going to look up sodium acetate in my solubility rule table in order to predict its solubility behavior. So if I have a look at sodium acetate, again, acetate is the first column on the left, and sodium is here next to last in this particular table, you'll see that in the intersection between the two ions, I'm told that this particular compound should be soluble. So that means that I should expect sodium acetate to produce an aqueous solution. Whereas if I compare silver chloride, here's silver, and here's chloride. And if I travel to the box that intersects both of those ions, I see in this particular instance that compound is predicted to be insoluble. So I would expect silver chloride to remain a solid as the reaction forms it. Now, there is a way to sort of condense this reaction. Basically, we're looking at what we refer to as the overall equation for the double displacement reaction. But there is a way to represent the formation of the silver chloride solid exclusively. Now, this type of solid product that's formed from a double displacement reaction, we actually refer to those types of products as precipitate. And we refer to those reactions that produce them as precipitation reactions. And so let's actually take this equation apart using the skill we learned 
in Chapter 12, Section 1 in order to get a more concise view of the precipitation reaction. If you recall, if sodium chloride produces an aqueous solution, that means I will get each of the constituent ions. So that means I would get the sodium cation and the chloride anion. The same can be said of the silver acetate. That forms an aqueous solution, so I should get the silver cation as well as the acetate anion. And that takes care of the reactants. If I move over to the product side, again, I expect sodium acetate to produce an aqueous solution. So that means I would get the sodium cation as well as the acetate anion. However, knowing that we've predicted silver chloride to remain solid, I cannot show silver chloride splitting apart into its constituent ions because we just said that we're getting a precipitate there. We should not expect silver ions or chloride ions, uh, chloride ions on the product side. So that means I'm going to leave that as silver chloride solid. Now, the equation that we just generated is what we call the total ionic equation. Now, if you examine the equation carefully, you should see that the sodium cation appears on either side. That means that the sodium cation is not involved in the actual formation of the precipitate. It's what we refer to as a spectator ion. And since it's not directly involved in the precipitation and it appears in both the product side and the reactant side, then that means I can cancel the sodium cations out. That doesn't mean they're not present in the solution. It just means that they're not actively involved in the formation of the silver chloride precipitate. Pardon me. Put that back. They're not involved in the formation of the sodium chloride precipitate. Now, if I examine what's left of the equation, I'll see that there is one more ion that does that exact same thing. It's the acetate ion. The acetate ion appears on both sides. It's not involved in the formation of the silver chloride precipitate, so I can cross that out. If I then write whatever is left of my totally ionic equation over, I'll get silver cation in aqueous solution and chloride anion in aqueous solution, yielding my silver chloride precipitate. So this more concise version of the equation that shows only the formation of the precipitate, that is what we call the net ionic equation. Okay, so let's take one more example. Okay, in the second example, I've got ammonium nitrate and sodium sulfate reacting with each other. And so again, based on what we've learned about the five types of chemical reactions, we know that a double displacement reaction should occur here. The ammonium is going to pair up with the sulfate ion. The sodium will pair up with the nitrate ion. So I was able to predict my two product formulas based on what we know about double displacement reactions. Now, if I want to predict the state of matter for each of the products, then once again, I'll have to consult the solubility rule. So if I go back, to the solubility rule, if I look up ammonium and if I look up sulfate, again, if I travel to the intersection of those two ions, in that box I see that it is predicted to be soluble. So that means that ammonium sulfate should produce an aqueous solution. Okay, if I look up sodium nitrate, then, okay, I have sodium here, and then the nitrate ion is here. If I travel to the intersection of both of those ions, that is also a soluble compound. And so basically here, I would then have to indicate that this would also give me an aqueous solution. So much like we did in the first example, let's actually make the attempt to write a net ionic equation here. So the first step is to produce the total ionic equation by breaking down each aqueous solution of a soluble salt or a soluble ionic compound into its constituent ion. So basically, based on this 
ammonium nitrate being an aqueous solution, that means that I should get ammonium ion. Okay, but notice that there's a coefficient of two. So I should get two moles of ammonium ion. I should also get nitrate ion. But again, because of this coefficient of two in front of the whole compound, that distributes through. That means I should also get two moles of nitrate ion. If I move on to the next reactant, basically here, I should get sodium ions, but because of this subscript 2, that means that there are two moles of them. If I then take a look at the other half of sodium sulfate, I should get sulfate ions, and sulfate ions have a negative 2 charge. That takes care of everything on the reactant side. If I take a look at the product side, then I should get ammonium ions here because again we're expecting ammonium sulfate to be aqueous because of this subscript two that means i get two moles of it if i then have a look at the anionic portion of the compound i should also expect sulfate ions here moving on to the second product notice again sodium nitrate in this case it's also aqueous and so that means because of this coefficient of two i should get two moles of sodium ions as well as two moles of nitrate ions. Now, there was no precipitate in this particular reaction. And if we take a look at the spectator ions carefully, you'll see that the ammonium should cancel. You should see that the nitrate also cancels, the sodium cancels, and the sulfate will cancel. So basically everything cancels. All that means when we get a total ionic equation that looks like that is that basically we expect no reaction. Basically what happens is as these ions in these two compounds dissociate, there's no reaction between them to form a new compound that would lead to a precipitate. And so in those instances, all we get is essentially a mixture with all these different ions sort of floating around inside of it. And so now that we've demonstrated this, okay, what I would suggest is for you to work on the follow-up questions associated with this pre-lecture tutorial. Obviously, we're going to go and continue to work with this material in class tomorrow. If there are any questions, again, by any means, email, or if you'd like to bring up the question in class, that would also be great. Okay, have a good night.